I'm Dan Quisenberry from MAPSA, and uh, pleased to have uh, any of you here that are here, and uh, uh, really excited about the school hosting us, taking time out of their day to uh, let us be part of this. Uh, it's a good school, it's a great school in this city for uh, parents to choose from. But this is an important moment um, for charter schools in Michigan, so uh, even though we couldn't have uh, all 300 school folks here today, um, this, is t this celebrates the 20 year history of charter schools in Michigan because 20 years ago this fall, the first charter schools were opening in the state. And uh, uh, they provide an important opportunity for parents around Michigan. So uh, uh, in fact, uh, at the end of this month, uh, 1994, Time Magazine uh, ran this cover, New Hope for Public Schools, uh, was celebrating uh, education reform and the fact that charter schools uh, were, were becoming prevalent around the country. Uh, this student is uh, Zachary Lifum. He's a student from the West Michigan Academy of Environmental Science in Grand Rapids. That school still is, uh, exists today. It's a very successful school on the west side of the state. Uh, we've actually uh, tracked down Zachary, who's a very successful musician uh, in the Chicago area, graduated from that school. Um, but the point was, uh, charter schools were exciting and Michigan was the face of this new idea and this new hope in public education, how we can make schools even better uh, than they are today. We also got exciting news last week. Um, we weren't expecting it, but uh, uh, we do hold ourselves accountable and look for ways to make sure schools are doing what they're intended to do, that the dreams and the visions from 20 years ago are being realized. And uh, we're excited to celebrate the health of the public charter school movement uh, sector. Uh, this was a report that evaluated all the states in the country that have significant charter school laws, 26 of them, and Michigan was ranked third in the country. And uh, it's a comprehensive, rigorous uh, analysis um, of the charter school movement. So states that did well, um, are, we're certainly excited about our ranking at third, but there's some states that aren't so happy with those rankings. Um, so. Uh, covered uh, things like academic success, uh, showing that Michigan is uh, producing academic, good academic outcomes for its students. Uh, it looked at things like how, how what's the ratio between opening schools and intervening in schools that aren't working. Uh, it looked at uh, whether you're offering these new choices in communities that really need them. And uh, uh, looking at places where you're using a variety of innovation in charter schools and also looked at things like uh, oversight and how well authorizers are doing their job. So uh, those are the things that matter in, in how well you're doing charter schools. And, and again, we're excited that Michigan ranks so well uh, on all those reports. Uh, there's another, um, and you can see the others, there's the other uh, um, state and some of the rankings there. We also would uh, continue to point to uh, a very important report that was done by Stanford University. It was the most extensive uh, comparison of academic outcomes. Um, that's what matters most, is how well we're doing with our kids. And yet it's a very difficult thing to try to measure, particularly across states, and try to comparing school buildings to other school buildings. This was the most extensive report. And importantly, uh, in the city of Detroit, uh, where 27% of the uh, charter school students are, uh, it showed that I, even on average, uh, students in a charter school in Detroit are getting an additional three months of education when you're looking at reading and math. Uh, those things matter uh, to the parents that are making those choices and again this is a very highly credible uh, report. Um, but okay so, so what Dan how are we doing today we always try to keep up track of those things and how well uh, students in our schools are doing so we are looking at some current MEAP data uh, and we broke it down uh, by subgroup Go ahead and show the next report there, buddy. Um, these are MEAP scores in Detroit for the 2013-14 school year, uh, broken down by subgroups. So you've got all students and then different uh, categories of students. Again, it's really important to watch how well we're doing, not just look at the big averages. But what was exciting is that uh, with this data and this year, uh, in reading and in math in every single category except for one, uh, the charter schools were performing better than their traditional counterparts. Um, 
sometimes I struggle. I don't want to always compare just the traditional. It's an important benchmark is the point. How well are we doing and how well are the parents choosing these options doing? Uh, this is showing a very significant uh, improvement for any kind of uh, student, uh, no matter where they are in the city of Detroit, again, except for one subcategory. Um, what's really important, I know if you talk to principal here at uh, Mr. Kinsey at uh, Premier Academy, he's paying attention to how well his kids here in this building are doing. But uh, it's our job to kind of make sure that the sector is really doing what it's supposed to, and we're excited about those results. Now, I'm going to address the uh, elephant in the room, so to speak. Well, Dan, you're releasing this information. Um, aren't you going to bias it? Uh, I can tell you this is no uh, uh, significant analysis. This is like a scoreboard. Um, anybody can pull this data up if you know where to find it, and you'll just see the, the raw data and the rankings of it. It's not an analysis. It's not research. So the ability to uh, manipulate this some way is really taken out. It literally is a scorecard. Um, and that's just how good it looks um, when you're looking at the basic data. Um, so that's important. Uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about is something that's been frustrating, kind of troubling uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, uh, the Michigan legislature, several of the representatives, in fact, 47 of the Michigan House Democrats, introduced a bill, 5852. Uh, it's called a moratorium bill. Uh, the premise was we need more accountability in charter schools. In actuality, the so-called moratorium bill uh, would bring an end to the ability of authorizers to amend the charter contract. And when you do that, you're literally uh, limiting and, and eliminating the ability of a charter school to continue to offer choices to parents. You can't grow grades, you can't grow enrollment, and in fact, you can't even enroll or excuse me, renew your charter contract. So we've already started to schedule out. If this bill were to pass, uh, you would see charter schools across Michigan systematically close because they would be unable to renew their contracts. So let's take a look at what that would actually do if this were to become law. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, sorry, 50 schools. Uh, whose contracts are up as early as next summer. And I'm going to give you a highlight of a few of them. Again, 50 out of the 300 schools in Michigan would, if this were to become law, you'd have 50 schools that would not be able to renew their contracts by next, by next summer. Uh, 12 of those schools would be in the city of Detroit. And uh, that's what the next slide was, is the, uh, the beginning of, of, of some of those schools. Uh, one of them is here, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Academy. Uh, Typically, almost historically, one of the top performing academic schools in the city of Detroit uh, would not be able to renew their contract. It's a, it's a great uh, small community, neighborhood school, um, been there for almost close to 20 years, chartered by Detroit Public Schools. The West Michigan Academy of Arts and Academics is in Spring Lake. Uh, you can see the data there. Uh, it's got a performing arts focus. Uh, it's, it too has been around for at least 15 some years, uh, done well historically. Um, as you can see, 91 percentile on top of the bottom list just recently, not be able to renew their contract. Marshall Academy in Marshall, Michigan. Uh, I would call Marshall Academy a, just a regular small community uh, school. They have a strong connection with their families. Um, they've been there for, again, 15 years. Uh, they've made tremendous progress. I know the school enough to know uh, they don't, weren't always watching the meat test. They did well with their kids, but they started to watch the numbers more closely, make sure they were really getting the outcomes that they knew were there. And you can see that they've started to uh, move up in terms of, uh, uh, of the, the way the state measures them. West Michigan Aviation Academy. <coughs> Uh, a newer school. They just graduated their first uh, high school uh, graduating class, so they've been around for about four years. Uh, this, is, this shows the opportunity in the future for charter schools. We're talking about 20 years of history of charter schools. This is the kind of thing we have an opportunity for going into the future. Uh, talk about uh, not only a focus on aviation, where kids can learn to fly and learn everything about the aviation industry, uh, they're doing engineering, STEM, math, and science, all the things that people are talking about focusing on. The school has just got it embedded. 
not be able to renew its contract by next spring, uh, next summer. Connor Creek Academy in Roseville, uh, again, uh, a good, solid community school, uh, even though it's located in Roseville, a uh, significant number of the kids here come from Detroit or the Detroit metro area. Um, and you can see that their performance too has been uh, increasing of late and uh, they too would not be able to renew their contract. So our point is um, 20 years ago we were celebrating their opening. Uh, they were the hope uh, of trying to improve our public education system. They are public schools and offering parents, empowering parents to make choices and actually empowering educators to make different kinds of choices. And yet we're still here 20 years later. Uh, we've seen academic success. We're seeing other kinds of success. And yet um, we've got legislation that uh, uh, for, for some reason says it's time to shut this down. So uh, we're concerned about that and uh, both celebrating the things that have been successful but pointing out where there are cons some concerns. Um, I want to introduce uh, probably the most important person in the room, a parent. Um, uh, there's 140,000 parents that chose charter schools last year. We're expecting that to be higher again this year. Uh, we just don't have the official enrollment numbers yet. But uh, Kanisha Brady is from the David Ellis Academy. Again, a very uh, successful charter school here in the city of Detroit. And uh, she's representative of those 140,000 parents that have made choices. And uh, she came here today to, to speak for them. Well, good morning. Thank good you morning. for having me. Um, as he said, my name is Kamisha Brady. I am a parent, um, along with my husband of two daughters that have been enrolled in charter school their entire education so far. Um, we had to decide, or it was challenging at the time in 2005 when we had to decide where our children would go to school. That was in the thick of Detroit's decline where the school enrollment was low and families were migrating. Um, I live in a good community in Detroit, uh, and I'm a Detroiter for life, um, so we don't plan on moving. Um, but my schools and my immediate zip code, I would not send my children to. They were either abandoned or low performing. And so I was glad to have the opportunity to choose a charter school. Um, it's not close, so we do have to drive. Um, but we've been impressed with David Ellis, and I did my research as a parent. You know, that wasn't my original choice. I did the research first, and that was a good fit for my children. Um, it's a partnership. I'm there all the time. All the students know me. You would think that I taught there, and I'm not a teacher. Um, um, my oldest daughter um, is in the ninth grade, so she's at a premier high school in Detroit. So that's indicative of her education at David Ellis Academy. Uh, she was very well prepared. She's uh, adjusting. Um, she had very good experiences at David Ellis outside of the classroom. But I had no other alternative. So if, if, the, if the idea right now is to close charter schools, then I would say for myself and other parents, I'm sure, what, what are we left with besides having to move? And everybody can't move. I'm unemployed right now. That is not in my best interest to move. And I'm employable, but that's not in my best interest. And I don't want to um, disrupt my children's current state of education, because I think it's great. So as a parent, I think charter schools are great. I'm glad it was my choice. Thank you, Commissioner. Also want to introduce a, a guest, uh, Representative Santana, as I mentioned, 47 of uh, 50 uh, uh, House Democratic members uh, signed this moratorium bill. Representative Santana was one that did not. And uh, he was uh, excited to come here today to celebrate public education. But we fully expect him to uh, not be our champion necessarily, but to hold public schools, including charter schools, accountable. So we're just excited to have him here celebrating the fact that parents can make choices. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Are you guys excited? Yes. Absolutely. Good. You should be because it's a good day. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, it, this issue about education, this is the one thing I've discovered as an elected official. It is the most nebulous subject you can ever try to debate in Lansing. And I'll tell you why. It's harder than rocket science. It's harder than physics. It's harder than 
whether or not we should build another nuclear facility. Why? Because there's so much emotions that get wrapped up into the discussion about education. The decision I made in not supporting this bill was because I do not want to get in between Ms. Brady and her decision about what is best for her child. That, to me, is what this bill is all about. 20 years ago, and I remember this debate 20 years ago when this first happened, there was a furious debate in Lansing about this was going to be the end of public education. This was going to be how horrible it was going to be. Here we are 20 years later with everything we know, with as far as we've advanced politically and in the government and otherwise, as you stand in my ninth house district, 50% of the children that live in this district attend charter schools. Now, these numbers are rough, but more or less are accurate. You look citywide at school-age children, just around 50%, if not more, attend charter schools or schools outside of the Detroit Public Schools. Now, I'm not going to bash Detroit Public Schools because we have some very good Detroit Public Schools. And there are some very good teachers and administrators and principals at Detroit Public Schools. But here's what we have to recognize. Parents have made decisions in the best interest of their children. The question we have to ask is not, should we shut down charter schools? It's how should we improve them? Because they're here and parents have already decided that they're going to be here because they want to continue to send their children to them. So are they perfect? No. And I think that the charter school folks will tell you, we're not perfect. Do we need to improve? Yes. Well, let's work on improving them. And that's what I'm here to basically say. And let me close off by saying this. You're in my district. And if you want, we can go and knock on any door you want. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to likely find after about an hour of door knocking. Four generations of illiteracy sitting in one living room. That is a huge statement. Harvey, how do you qualify that? Four generations? You have a 15-year-old that just gave birth to a child. She's living with her mother. And they're living with the mother's mother. Not one of them have more than a GED or high school education. Not one of them have more than a minimum wage job. One, if not two, are in some form of public assistance. In that living room, there's probably a 15 to 16 year old young man who's looking at this situation and says, I want nothing to do with it. So you know what he does? He walks out his front door, goes two blocks down, hangs a right, finds an abandoned house with all of his friends, sits on the porch, and where do you think it's going to go from there? Because all of those young men walked out of their living rooms with that same situation. That's the challenge we have, and that's the challenges that walk into these classrooms every day. You talk to any of these parents, you talk to the principal standing here, he'll tell you some of the stories of what walks in here. But we've become so accustomed as a society to look at scores, to look at this issue or that issue, and we've neglected the fundamental issue. And it's the human being that's sitting in these, cla in these classrooms, in these chairs, trying to look for a hope and an opportunity in a country that's supposed to be the greatest in the world. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm here to tell you is that I'm not here to shut the door on any opportunities. I'm here to help improve the opportunities that are in front of us. And if it means that I don't sign on to a bill that does that, then I'm happy to do that. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Um, Dan, where sure. in the legislation does it say that charter schools would be closed and unable to renew contracts? Yeah, I don't have the, the exact wording in front of me, but it basically prohibits uh, any amendments to a contract or any new contracts. A renewed contract is a new contract. So if you eliminate the ability to establish a new contract, there would be no renewals and schools would start to, uh, as their current contracts expired, they would be unable to continue their existence. Well, if, could you get me on this, the specific wording? Um, 
I can email that to you yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the other side, uh, Jennifer, to jump into it, uh, many who have signed the bill said, well, we didn't intend that. Well, that's exactly what the wording says. Well, Dan, it's in exchange for some things. Uh, here's, here, I did write these down. Complete transparency and no definition of what that means. I, I, I mean, I don't know what complete transparency is. I also don't know what comprehensive ethics and conflict standards are. I mean, I can understand the words logically, but that's not a legal definition. And then this one really gets you, because I know how hard this is, assurance of high quality education standards and outcomes. Um, sure, we want that. I don't know what that means. We've debated those things for years. Uh, I can't imagine the legislature coming to a quick conclusion about any one of those things, let alone all three. So how can you be so definitive about how the moratorium would work and leave these three vague ideals in this legislation for the very reasons, and Representative Santana was very uh, appropriate about that. Wait a second, this is eliminating opportunities. Should we be raising expectations? Absolutely. Should we be raising um, outcomes? Absolutely. But uh, this looks, uh, it, it'd be a bad idea if it were to happen, and uh, it, it's, it's wrong directed. Yeah, absolutely. You are the most important person in the room. You can say what. Just to um, piggyback off what the representative said about that scenario, that family, uh, with 18 years of experience, 15 in social services, and three in education, that is absolutely correct. So if we close schools, that particular family more likely doesn't have transportation. It's a barrier. So sometimes they simply choose the charter school in that community because that's the closest you want to get to. So if you shut that school down and the next school that is seven miles away, then we're going to increase the dropout rate. Yeah. Because you have to think about that population of people as well. Sometimes the resources are not there. And I might not be resourceful enough to figure out how to get to school, so I just won't go. You know, as a parent, if you shut the schools down, what are my options? You know, every parent wants a better education for their children than they had. You know, I graduated from DPS schools. I went to Michigan State. But also at Michigan State, I realized that I had some struggles that my competitive schools, you know, your private schools, they have the money to provide certain resources. So you're going to get a different, you're going to produce a different student. But when that is not your option, then what is the option? So if we think that these poor communities are in a state of destitute or degradation, then it's going to be worse if we don't have any education opportunities. Dan, you mentioned that you believe the charter school community wants to and needs to improve accountability and quality. How do you see that occurring right now? Yeah, a good question. In fact, the report, the health of the sector report, does offer some recommendations. Um, that Michigan should pay attention to. One of them is certainly driving academic outcomes. Um, uh, one of those would be having a consistent measure in this state for all of our schools. Uh, we've supported for a year and a half uh, an A through F letter grading system. Um, we measure kids with A through F. Uh, schools are already being measured. Why don't we do something simplistic that's easily understood, that has real rubrics and metrics behind it uh, to kind of help drive our academic outcomes. Um, I could go into a lot longer explanation about that, but Michigan as a whole, none of our schools are doing really well. So that's one thing, Rob, would be to uh, create a system that supports driving the academic outcomes and helping people know where we are. The other is to continue to uh, uh, create opportunities like charter schools. I, I, I kind of mentioned in a reference the West Michigan Aviation Academy. Um, Everyone in education understands how hard this is, particularly with the kids. Um, Representative Santana was talking about families and communities that we're talking about. So one of the ways you really work past that is to engage kids in their education in a very meaningful way. That's what uh, project-based learning is. I mean, those kids, if you walk into the West Michigan Aviation Academy, they're not special children. They're coming from downtown Grand Rapids. They're in poverty. 
Um, but those kids are just off the charts. High school kids excited about their education. That matters. Um, and I'm, I'm going to watch over the years as their outcomes uh, come out that they're going to get to a place that are exceeding um, what we currently see in our education system. So one of those continuing to offer those innovative ideas. So academic outcomes, uh, innovative ideas, and then they talk a lot about, uh, particularly in a place like Detroit, offering the supports that make choice work really well. Um, we don't have good information. So, you know, uh, diligent parents like uh, Ms. Brady will figure this out. Uh, do all parents uh, have the resources to make good decisions? Uh, is the information easily accessible? Uh, that they would care about and they want to make decisions about, those, that's important. And then we do have systems in place to help them actually make those choices. So uh, academic outcomes, continued opportunities, and uh, good support for parents, I think, is really, really helpful. Funding, you know, I, you, know you, have to, you always have to have funding in there. Um, 20 years ago when we established charter schools, we created a per pupil funding the kids, not institution system. And we need to continue to do that. In fact, um, as, as, our, as our mom said, uh, we've got kids who are real need. We probably ought to be reflecting poverty in there someplace so that the kids in the schools that are serving those populations are really able to do what they need to do to help kids. Uh, that's equitable, right? Because they don't have all the advantages everybody else has.